Hello, everyone. Welcome into another episode of the Coast to Coast podcast here from InsideCarolina.com. I'm Joey Powell. We are brought to you by Johnny T-Shirt and Congruity. With us, as always, Sherell McMillan and Sean Moran, the two guys that bring the info that you have come to expect from us, very high-level uh, and also in-depth looks at UNC basketball, specifically uh, what's going on with the roster and recruiting. Uh, there's not really much else we can dig into uh, until the season starts, but if you're paying attention, that happens on Monday, the 23rd, is when the team can actually uh, officially, according to the NCAA, practice. Uh, they've been doing a lot of stuff uh, since then that the NCAA does not deem practicing, but on Monday, the 23rd, they can officially do what the NCAA calls practicing. If you know the difference between those two things, let me know. Uh, but without further ado, let's get moving. Uh, there's been a lot happening with regard to uh, official visits. You guys know how important those are for the program to get guys on campus, uh, especially during football season. Won't talk about any football outcomes, but uh, over the last two weeks, North Carolina has had visits from uh, Braylon Mullins, a 6'5 shooting guard from Greenfield, Indiana, uh, who was here uh, last week as we record this. And then this past weekend, the number one player in the class, A.J. DeBansa, was here, uh, 6'9", small four out of Hurricane, Utah. Shrell, I'll let you give us the opening salvo about those two visits and kind of how they went for North Carolina. I'm going to ask you a question, Joey, and ask you, Sean. How, how do you think the visit went, both visits? Both were great. The parents really liked what they saw. They liked UNC's atmosphere. They could really see themselves fitting in here. Uh, they liked seeing the team get up and down. They were really impressed by the environment. Uh, Michael Jordan played here. Have I hit all of them yet? All right, so we can move on to the next thing. Now, for, forgive, my, <laughs> <laughs> forgive my cynicism. It has been a, uh, a rough uh, weekend in a variety of, of phases of life, um, multiple phases, three phases in particular. Specifically um, three phases, yes. Specifically three phases. But no, uh, so I, I would say the visits do go well. And that, I know that's a cliche, and everybody says that. Nobody, as we said, is going to be like, this visit was terrible. But it is a chance it, specifically for Mullins to really get on campus. He said so many times, like, I want to see it with my own two eyes about different schools. I want to put my feet on the ground and walk around campus and see what it's like and get a feel for being a student there. And how does it compare to, you know, the schools I've visited before? So it, it was a, a big deal for him. And it's also, these guys don't get a lot of in-person kind of face time with the coaches. Like they might have an in-home visit <clears throat> and they might see him at the gym during um, open run a couple of times and talk to them, but uh, you know, in person, away from the phone and not text or DM doesn't happen that often. So it really is a chance for uh, you know the kind of the charm to come in, and and that's why recruiting visits in the past have been such a huge deal. Now, I'll say that I think <laughs> in this new reality of where we are now, um, with you know pay for play and salary and and all that good stuff, I think the visits have kind of taken a step back. They are not deciders like they used to be uh, i think in the past if a guy was torn between a couple of schools if he had a great visit at one school he was more likely to go to that school i think now it's kind of just another box to check um, to make sure that you're comfortable but in the end you know um nine times out of ten even though players have said it's not about <laughs> salary and it's not about nil that is a very key you know component of a school's total package now um I think in the cases of both Mullins and DeBansta, like I said, there was real value in them being on campus because neither had been to UNC. Um, but just keep that in mind that, yes, all these things are good and great trip and family loves you know the school and the coaches and all that stuff. But in the end, this is a business now. And so business is about money. And um, while it may not be the only motivation, it's definitely a, a big factor in all of these kids' visits moving forward. Shrill, I'm not going to ask you to get too far into detail because I know a lot of that stuff is, is kind of typed around the program. But uh, do you feel, and you can give a one-word answer if you want, do you feel like North Carolina is, uh, is in the game, pardon the pun, with regard to uh, the types of proposals they're putting forward in front of these players uh, in the NIL sphere, I guess? Yes. Love it. Thank you. Sean, I want to ask you, do you think both of these guys, I mean, they're both, you know, Mullins is a top 20 kid on 24-7. Uh, DeBanta, as I mentioned, is the, is the top recruit in this class. Do you feel like both of these guys walk into starting jobs, whichever, you know, college campus they end up on? Definitely DeBanta. I don't think there's any question around 
that given given the talent and for the most part i'd say so for mullins given what he showed uh the spring and summer i think for him it, it, that's probably more of a team by team scenario unc is projected to uh potentially lose a lot you could see him uh more easily sliding sliding in in terms of some of the others uh i would imagine so but i'd say he's you know he's more a little bit more situational dependent uh but you know with Divansa, everybody's been talking about him since the time that he he entered high school and has been playing on on the circuit so it's really more who's going to be surrounding surrounding him uh versus you know Mullins then then you're probably looking a little more at the depth charts to to see what what are the pieces at that 2 3 spot um that that could go either in front or or uh around him Sherelle, what do you say to people uh, that are in the recruiting sphere and uh, maybe hosts on specific Inside Carolina basketball recruiting podcasts that say there's no way in hell A.J. DeBance ends up in Chapel Hill? What do you say to those folks? Um, <laughs> you, thanks, Joy. I appreciate you putting me on the spot like this for everybody. Uh, I would say you can't discount what Hebrew Davis has done. Um, I would say going back to the 2024 class and how – he relates to some of these kids who um, have everything in front of them, like Ian Jackson, um, like Elliot Cadeau at the time, who, again, we didn't really think North Carolina had a great shot with. Um, I would say that the financial commitment is going to take is going to be strong. And so it would be thus far out of character with how UNC has approached, I would say, both high school recruiting and portal recruiting to kind of um, set the market, so to speak. It's not saying they won't. I'm just saying that the realities of that are such that it's, it's going to take a lot. Um, so I, I wouldn't say he's not going to end up at UNC, um, but I would say that based upon the information we have and how UNC has operated in the past and the fact that, um, you know, BYU is kind of out in front and he's in Utah and um, there's been a, a lot of talk around <laughs> why he's in Utah I would say it's going to be an uphill climb for UNC, but again, you can't discount what Hubert Davis has done and going toe to toe with um, a bunch of great schools for guys like Ian Jackson and Harrison Ingram and Elliot Cadeau and Drake Powell to, to some extent as well. Yeah, and and I don't mean to you know totally take a crap on what the staff is is done and what the energy they're putting in. Um, I think more of you know that's just basically stuff that I've read, and 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 again, I'm not nearly as plugged in as you are, but. Um, I think it's a good answer, and I think hopefully that will give some realism to the folks listening and watching the show, which, by the way, I need all of them right now to like and subscribe if you have not to whatever your podcast content platform is, or if you're watching this on the old YouTubes there, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Um, Sherelle, you look like you were getting ready to say something else there. Did, did, did I need to open up the door again? I was going to jump in with a question. Uh, our way. Because for the first time, I think in my entire life, I have a player comparison that I ran by Sean. Stop. And it involves one of the recruits that I wanted to, one, Joey, just hear your thoughts. And I wanted to ask Sean the, the question in public. So mine for Bradley Mullins, uh, because, again, um, more athletic than you think, uh, can can shoot, um, is, is a good rebounder for his position. And just kind of, you know, he's either really smooth in how he shoots and how he does things, or he's like kind of attacking. And you're like, slow down, calm down a little bit. So... I gave the comp. I know they're not the same size. Bones is a little shorter. I said Reggie Bullock from a Carolina perspective. Mm. I asked Sean that offline. So, Sean, I wanted to get your thoughts on that publicly. And then, Joey, what, what do you think? When when you put it out there, I, I nodded and, and smiled and said, yeah, I could I could definitely see that. I think a little bit um, from the shoot, obviously the shooting ability, the shooting uh, just motion to a to a certain extent. I think from a, a size perspective, Bullock uh, at you know six 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 seven, obviously a little little bigger, but uh, it it definitely made sense when you when you did say it. Um, and once again, I'm not one big one for comparisons, but I think from the shooting, uh, being able to rebound, um, and once again going back to Reggie at at that time coming in with Kendall and um, and Harrison Barnes, uh, you know, a, a top twenty five five star guy that took a little while to get going uh at unc but i think in terms of for me the the shooting shooting motion um definitely made made a lot of sense okay so i'm clearly not as versed in 
you know, in film and, and player comps as you guys are, but, um, and I might draw some heat for this, but that's fine. I've, you know, <laughs> I, I've been a heel most of my life anyway. Um, I'm going to say Luke Kennard. Uh, I think there's some, I, I think there's some symbolisms outside of just their skin color, but I, I, I do see a little bit of, um, the way they both are able to score and drive with the basketball, but, um, and probably a little closer on the size, uh, size standpoint, but, uh, Sherelle, tell me why that's a terrible comp. I, I don't know that it is. I, like, again, I don't. I don't really do comps ever. This one just. <laughs> I was. I, I'm not going to tell you what I was watching. I was watching something from 2012 uh, for some reason because I was bored one night and I just because, finished because uh, YouTube happens. Yes. Yeah, and I had just finished a, a Batman episode of, of uh, Cape Crusader. It was really good. Yes, I'm an adult and I still watch cartoons, whatever. Um, and I couldn't find anything else to watch because I wasn't tired. And I was like, let me go back and watch this game from 2012 for some reason. And uh, just watching Bullock, I, people forget, I think, how good he was just because there was so much talent on those teams. Um, uh, but yeah, so so Mullins just came to mind. And, you know, just, I, I guess, moving the conversation forward with his recruitment, uh, he just finished up a visit to Indiana this past weekend. Um, he's been to UConn. Uh, he's been to UNC, obviously. He canceled his Duke visit. Um, and the Kentucky visit is, I would say, in limbo. There was some reporting that uh, he may take it this upcoming weekend, uh, but there's another source that we have who's pretty close to the situation that said, for now, the visit looks like it's staying on the books as October 25th, but that is a long time um, in between visits. You know, Indiana visit's done, and then it would be another month before an official visit, which means it'd be another month before he rendered a decision. So not sure if that visit's going to move up or if he won't take it, but uh, I, you know, I think you, I think UNC has a chance. You know, uh, for a lot of these recruitments uh, in 2025, they haven't had a chance. So I think this is one where it would still be surprising, just because of the other schools who have either, I, I guess, more cachet at the moment or have been on him longer. Um, but he genuinely and truly, I think, connected with the coaching staff um, on the visit is the word that we've gotten. So we'll we'll see. But I, I do think North Carolina's in it. Whether does that mean a commitment? I, you know, I don't know, but they are they are in it, um, whatever that means. Yeah, and you know, I'm sure fans and, and folks that are dialed into this show will probably uh, will probably appreciate that to an extent. And at some point, you know, and we'll talk about this in a second. You know, at some point, they'd like to get some of these guys. Um, Derek Dixon, speaking of which, uh, has an announcement coming up very soon. Do you want to uh, do you want to reset that for us, uh, Sean? I think you uh, you've got a pretty good pretty good lay on his you know on his game i'll let you kind of reset that for everybody and then sherelle if you want to mention what that plan or timeline looks like for for the player that'd be great yeah from well just from a physical standpoint uh last year at a camp he measured six two uh which i think was without shoes so you know add, add that plus the picture he took with hubert you can probably put him at six three six four and feel good about that but uh six two wingspan so you know, definitely not Bub Bub Carrington by any stretch of the imagine imagination, and and definitely a guy that you would foresee being in college for for four years, um, just given some of the maybe athleticism deficits that he does have. But whether it's playing at Gonzaga in high school or team takeover in AAU, uh, three point shooting has been his his primary calling card, and definitely I'd say a true combo guard where he's probably a natural two, um, but can can handle the ball, uh, but in reality, whether it's high school or AAU, has always been that number two or number three ball handler. Uh, but quick release on his on his shot, good footwork. Um, you know, not not somebody that's going to blow blow by you or you know probably create a lot in isolation. But when he's coming off screens uh, or or when he is in isolation, loves a little step back, um, jab step step back. Likes to go left if he does get into that mid range, extremely comfortable, and you can pretty much count it as good from a playmaking perspective. Uh, you know, not an Elliot Cadeau type type of player, given that uh, primary playing the two. But uh, when he does attack and get in the paint, he, he makes smart decisions. So very, uh, you know, a smart, I think, efficient um, and, and strong shooter defensively. Would have liked to have seen him try to guard some of the better guys uh when when he does have the opportunity so i'd say you know definitely some room to improve on, on the defensive end but i think a guy that you can count on not somebody that's going to make a class but somebody that can be a uh, ideally a strong player not 
where year one he's probably working into it uh but over the over the long haul is the type of guy that especially as a junior and senior you can probably get a lot out of strikes me as a guy that a lot of other recruits would want to play with but again i just 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 a kind of a pseudo outsider's opinion Shrill, where are we with his uh with his expected announcement this coming week yeah, so he's actually doing it uh, with 24-7 Sports on the 24-7 Sports channel. Um, that's online. You can find it on YouTube as well. I'm um, doing it with Adam Finkelstein, who's been a, a guest on here multiple times. It's Friday the 27th at 3 p.m. You can check out the announcement. Um, it's his 18th birthday, and he said for some time that's when he wanted to announce. So that is the plan. Uh, he's really down to four schools, Virginia, Pittsburgh, Vanderbilt, and UNC. He visited... Um, uh, Pittsburgh and Virginia both during his junior year. So those visits were back in the spring. And then he visited Vanderbilt and UNC um, in September. Uh, UNC was his last official visit. And then he took in uh, in-home visits from the uh, Vanderbilt staff from the Pittsburgh staff last Tuesday, I believe. And then um, the UNC staff was there for an in-home visit last Thursday. So um, if it matters, I'm not sure, but just a note that UNC got the last official visit and they got the last in-home visit. His plan was to um, kind of make a decision by the end of the weekend. So by the time you're listening to this, he probably will have a decision made and then we'll announce it on Friday. So that's where things stand. Um, he is now in the top 50 of 24 seven sports' uh, 2025 rankings. Um, and you know, from everything, we've seen and the people we talked to he just seems to be like the word is just like solid um he's played in the backcourt with nick lewis who is a point guard going to xavier both in aau and with team takeover and just the teams he's been on he understands the basketball structure and kind of how to play and i think uh that is one of the reasons that coaches like him so much he also had offers from arizona syracuse and a, a few other schools but um when you play for a team takeover you you have to know how to run sets and you have to know uh, you know, when to pass, when to shoot, how to defend. You have to know all that stuff. When you play for Gonzaga and Steve Turner, who coached uh, Nate Pritt in high school up in Sean's uh, stomping grounds, you you have to know how to play because you're, you're playing against some of the best competition in the country. So I think that's why a lot of people are excited about what he can do. Maybe not as a freshman, though there'll be opportunities probably wherever he goes. But definitely, as Sean said, into years two and three, you're, you're talking about someone who can be a really – High level, you know, all conference player wherever he decides to go, and that's the type of thing I think that you know is going to, it's going to remain a staple of of North Carolina's recruiting is are these kids that's in that you know fifty ish you know twenty five to fifty ish range that are you know stable and sound and and, and Cheryl you've talked about it before on here that that's that's highly likely to to be a, a mainstay and in, in where North Carolina looks to go with their recruiting strategy moving forward. Um, I want to ask you at what point, you know, and, and I'm, this is independent of anything that Derek Dixon chooses to, to do or not to do. At what point is it time for North Carolina fans to get worried about this, you know, this coming year? We've talked about before about how the, the timeline is different and how, you know, the pay for play has altered things and the way guys commit and their process of taking X amount of visits has changed quite a bit. But at what point is it time for North Carolina fans to to worry about the way that the twenty five class might be might be trending? John, <laughs> either one uh, of you I guys mean, can take that. Yeah. I was I I, I should have I should have named somebody, but either one of y'all can pawn that. I mean, I, I'd probably say a few weeks into October, uh, at, at probably at the latest, because you'll see uh, where Dixon ends up and. For the most part, the guys will have wrapped up their official visits um, that, that they were taking in September, early October. Uh, so I think you, you'll, you'll be able to, I know not everybody's going to be making a decision, but um, you can start to, most people have already, but you can start to make make more judgments in terms of who is, is left. Uh, once again, with, with everything now, you can always, you know, the high school classes are not the be all and end all with the, the transfer portal, but at the same time, I think when you look at, or at least when I've looked at uh, Duke or Kentucky over the years and they're bringing in the five-star recruits, my mind is, well, yeah, that's an easier sell because you're just pointing to the, the one-and-done player right there and saying, hey, there's going to be ample playing time. But that's what 
I, you know, I think UNC has been doing this year because there should be ample playing time for these guys next year. And if they're not able to reel some in, um, you know, obviously it'll be be disappointing, especially coming off off of that strong 2024 class. But you know, the times have have changed, and and it'll kind of show where UNC is in the general pecking order. I think in terms of how this class shapes up. Shrill, I'm not going to let you out without an answer. No, in general, I think the mind of a fan is is worry all the time, and I, I don't say that demeaningly. That's, I just think that's factual. That's no, okay. that's just kind of it's kind of is when you care about something as much as folks care about Carolina basketball, they're always going to wonder what's next, what's happening, why isn't you know their commit? Why has it been 19 months or 20 months since they had a high school commit? So I think it's fair to be worried now. Um, I think personally, I think another two weeks or so is is the line of kind of demarcation for me personally because <clears throat> as Sean said guys will be finishing up three four five visits and I think everyone said it back in July setting up an aggressive visit schedule of nine official visits between September 1st and November 2nd sounds great in July when you're not doing it but once you get to week three or four it's kind of like yeah I, I've had enough of this i, I I have an idea of where I might want to go. Let's let's talk to coaches and let's get this done. I think you're seeing a little bit of that now. Isaiah Dennis, who is coming to UNC on Friday, canceled his Michigan visit this past weekend. We talked about Mullins, uh, who has canceled some visits. Coa Pete canceled some visits. Um, not that Carolina is really uh, a factor there right now, um, but he canceled visits. So you're seeing guys are, are kind of tiring of the process a little bit. So I think we'll really see a lot of dominoes fall in the next two and a half two, two and a half weeks, and we'll have a better feel for what exactly North Carolina needs to do. Because right now, um, the guys that are recruiting are kind of it. There's not, there's really no one in the background in the high school class who they're like, yeah, just just hang on and we might call you in, in a couple right. of weeks. It, it's kind of the guys they have now or portal. Um, and I don't think they want to take seven or six or seven guys in the portal. They'd rather kind of do half and half, you know, three guys in high school, maybe three guys in the portal. So we'll see is, is the answer I would give. Uh, if you're a fan, no issues with, with you worrying right now. It's your right to worry. Um, but I think give it another two, two and a half weeks before you really press the panic button. And I'm not trying to pull a fire alarm at all by any means. But again, I feel like we owe it to our listeners just to try to, you know, just to try to get a an accurate pulse on things with you know, where they are and, and with these guys coming to campus pretty frequently. I think people are starting to pay attention and wondering when some of those proverbial shoes are going to drop. And that's what we said before, Joey. It, the the variance of this class, the variance is one of this podcast's favorite words, uh, is very is, is, is very volatile. It could be they could in a month they could have no commits and everything is insane, or they could have sold a couple of guys, got a guy that they maybe are close to leading for, and have three really solid commits. It, anything in between there could happen. Um, so I think that's the frustrating part for for fans. It's just that there's so much in, up in the air. There's not like, oh, well, Carolina has X player or Carolina has Y player already committed, so they'll be okay. This isn't a necessity. You're getting to the point now where all the guys left are, are close to necessities and you can't lose all of them. So I think that's where some of the uh, consternation is coming from. Uh, I want to get Sean to go full Dan Patrick show on us. And every time we use words like variance, he hits a little ding just so that you know it's, it's, it becomes more part of the – the coast to coast lexicon. Um, so the last thing I want to throw out there too is uh, with the staff is that have been going on. Cheryl, give us a reset there, and then Sean, I'm going to come to you with a question about specifically, you know, which of these guys you feel like you know, I asked you earlier where these guys are going to fit in. Do they start? Do they not start? I'm going to ask you in a second, and I'm giving you a chance to prep now. Which of the guys on UNC's board do you feel like are instant starters versus guys that are going to come in and probably take a year to get ready? Cheryl, tell us about where the staff has been over the last week or so. Uh, so they finished up that kind of whirlwind cross-country tour uh, two weeks ago. And then last week wasn't as visit-heavy, but they did get out um, to see Cole Cloer, um, who's the 2026 forward. Um, he's taking an official, an unofficial visit to UNC already this fall. Hubert Davis saw him. He's at uh, Caldwell Academy in Greensboro. The same day he saw Isaiah Dennis um, down in Charlotte, excuse me, in the Charlotte Metro in Davidson at Davidson Day, um, he saw Isaiah Dennis. Um, 
Brad Frederick, uh, assistant coach, I believe was up in India, well, around Indianapolis, in the Indiana area to see Braylon Mullins. And then the entire staff had an in-home visit with Derek Dixon that we talked about um, this past Thursday. And then they got back for uh, Demansta's visit on Friday. The thing with uh, the open evaluation period is you get a certain number of days on the road to see a prospect. Um, and it's, that carries over for the entire school year. So I, I can't remember the number. It's either seven or eight, but you get, just to say it's eight, I'll look it up and, and confirm in the thread. Let's just say it's eight. The Carolina staff gets eight off-campus evaluations slash viewings of that player. And basically you can choose to, you know, you can choose to deploy those how you want. You can only do it one per week though. So if UNC would just wanted to say, we're going to go all in on, you know, player Y, we're going to visit him once a week for eight straight weeks. They could do that, but then they'd be done for the rest of the calendar or rest of the academic year. So that's the way it works, and, and that's kind of what Carolina's working through. So someone like Derek Dixon, UNC's already had three, I believe. So they were in <clears throat> to see him in uh, open evaluation. I believe an assistant went by another time, and then they had the in-home. So that counts as three off-campus evaluations or viewings or visits um, for the staff. So that's what they're working through, and that's how they kind of plan things out for the year with different players and uh, targets. Thank you, sir. Sean, did I give you enough time to to hit me with the guys you feel like would be the most likely to jump into a start orientation should they end up at North Carolina? Yeah, obviously this depends on who who's coming back, but in my mind, penciling the, the freshmen in terms of Ian and, and Drake as one and done. Um, you know, I think there are worlds where one or both could come back. I, I, that wouldn't be ideal, but I could see, you know, I could see that. Um, once again, the, the world's not built on mock drafts in September and October before guys get get into actual playing time. But, you know, I've also seen Kay Tyson back end of a second round in, in one of those. So I think making some projections, we can go ahead. But the front court is, I'd say, a little more probably stable than the than the back court. Awesome. But wow. in, in terms of sorry, in terms of particular players, I think for the most part, D Dixon to to me is probably I could see either way because uh, once again I think you're expecting Trimble uh, whether Cadeau's back or they they go with a, a guy in the portal. Um, Dennis to me probably would be the one guy that would feel comfortable saying hey he's most likely going to come off the bench. Um, mm -hmm. I think Mullins is the guy you can pencil him in probably at the the three spot. Um, and then, uh, obviously, the, the higher rank guard guys, especially Divance and others, you could you could pencil in. Um, Kamania, quite, probably a question mark on on what the what the lineups looking like. So, those five star guys, I think you could pencil them in. Um, you know, the, the four star kind of sub sub thirty. Uh, then then it's really more around lineup because I think as you go through years and years of these rankings, once you get out of that five star um ranking sure you're going to have your top four stars but anything outside of 40 can be a, a real question mark especially as a as a freshman and I, I i appreciate that i put you in a tough spot there but i i knew you'd be pretty apt at threading that needle um one of the things you mentioned is you know a guy like the, the five star kids especially if you're thinking about a player like the bansa um you know he's obviously the consensus number one in the class it's kind of like Johnny T. the consensus number one for USC, you know, gear and, and apparel. Um, I stopped by Johnny T-shirt last week. I mentioned this on the radio show Saturday, um, but I stopped by Johnny T-shirt last week. I needed to get something. I uh, called ahead. Of course, they had it. Uh, lady that answered the phone was just amazingly helpful, as they are always. Uh, showed up, and I, you know, went to go ring it out. I was like, hey, um, you know, I wanted to use my IC discount. And she said, yeah, um, he's like, yeah, the, I always have people coming in here saying, yeah, the host tell us we have to come by. So, so that's why I'm here. I, I'm, you know, I'm not just saying this so that you guys will feel a severe level of FOMO out there in listener land, but you really should feel a severe level of FOMO out there because it's clear that everybody's going to Johnny T-shirt and you don't want to be left out. Um, while I was there, I did notice they had all kinds of, uh, there was even some, some good looking stuff on the clearance rack, but they had all kinds of just new stuff that looked amazing. Uh, Sherelle is, is a Nike guy. Sherelle is a Jordan brand guy. And I'm fairly certain if 
unchecked, Sherelle could go in there and do some serious financial damage. Uh, so I, I want you all who are listening to this and the sound of my voice, go to johnnytshirt.com or stop by in the store, see what we're talking about, recognize the amazing customer service, uh, appreciate what they do for the Chapel Hill community and for the UNC fan base, and for, you know, I see listeners everywhere. Uh, they're great folks. We want the great folks that listen to this show to be linked up with other great folks. Check them out. Use your premium discount code to get an extra 10% off, and you'll be happy you did. Uh, we love Johnny T-Shirt. want you guys to love them as well. JohnnyT-Shirt.com. Uh, we're going to take a brief break. If you're listening to us on audio, there will be some national advertisements dropped in here, uh, and then we'll be right back to talk a little bit about player previews for this coming season. Stick around. Coast to Coast Podcast here on InsideCarolina.com. All right, thanks, everybody, for being a part of the show. I'm Joey Powell. Sherelle McMillan and Sean Moran are with me, as always, here on the Coast to Coast podcast for IC. Uh, what we started last show, we're going to continue doing up until uh, the game start, is we're doing a little bit of player preview uh, as we kind of help you guys get ready and turn the page over to the 24-25 roster. Last week, we did R.J. Davis and Jalen Withers. Uh, this week, we're going to go to Seth Trimble and Jalen Washington. So what I'm going to try to do is give Sean and Sherelle – uh, some space to really dive into what these guys can be, uh, but then also what they need to be for North Carolina to be successful this year. And and you may start hearing some of the same themes because of what the team's needs are, but I think you're going to be able to understand a little bit more about where these players will fit in within the roster, uh, the construct, and what Hubert Davis is going to want to do with regard to style of play this upcoming season. Sean, I'm going to come to you first. I remember when Seth Trimble hit the portal and then, uh, you know, took out the cartridge, blew on it, put it back in and reset everything and came back to UNC. Uh, I think, as Sherelle mentioned multiple times, I think that is a just as good as getting a, a kid out of the portal um, from another school when Hubert Davis is able to get Seth to stick around. What I want to ask you, Sean, is what do you feel like uh, has to happen uh, between last season and the first game for Seth Trimble to do what North Carolina needs of him, and what are those things? Yeah. It, first off, it was a great uh, re-addition uh, for him. Him sticking around, obviously, from from his point of view, you could see RJ coming back, Elliot coming back, and now you're adding I Ian Jackson to the mix from the guard spot and saying, "Hey, I'm going to go somewhere else and and try to start from day one." But uh, obviously, a, a pull in in Chapel Hill, and I think for him, you saw a significant improvement from that freshman to to sophomore season, and I, I think there can be another continued continued one. Obviously, the season ended in a distasteful manner for him on the bench um, and not really getting in much against Alabama in the second half after he, I think he missed uh, missed one of those second half shots. But in, in terms of his junior season, you know, obviously coming off the bench, but I, I do think continued improvement on that, on that three-point shot from a percentage you look and say, oh, you know, he shot 41, but on a very small sample size. And you did see in the ACC play, uh, that number dropped down into the you know the 20s from a percentage, and and teams were starting to play off of him. But I think when he was attacking the basket, when he was cutting, um, you know, you could just see the confidence that that he was reacting, um, you know, so quickly and and not having to process things. Maybe like his his freshman year, from a defensive perspective, I think we've always seen how he's able to guard on ball. You know, go back to the Michigan State game where he was blocking, you know, centers, center shots. Um, I, I think defensively continue to be that that pest or be that almost that lockdown defender when he is in the game. Um, you know, I, I think trying to create turnovers, uh, deflections, steals, getting the team out in transition, I think will will be significant from a defensive perspective. And then offensively, I think, uh, you know, if he can once again continue to be more of a threat from the three point line, obviously the percentage increased, um, you know, still haven't seen over the two years, a whole lot of what, even when, when we had him on the podcast, maybe four years ago now, you know, if he had a go-to move, it's really getting into that pull up jump shot. Um, and we, we haven't seen that a lot, uh, but you did start to see him finish better just given that athleticism, uh, which, which sometimes as a freshman was, you were wondering where he was trying to go with the ball. So I think it's really, and I think it's realistic to expect him to be comfortable in this situation. Um, won't, won't be surprised that he's finishing games out, especially from a defensive end. But I think, as we're going to see, you can't be a liability offensively. Uh, if people are playing off of you, you've got to be able to 
make them pay in, in other ways. And I think that's always going to be the question for him and Cadeau. But I would see an increase in his overall points per game, um, an increase in his minutes, not to a, a great extent, but definitely excited around uh, around Tribble and what he can bring now in his, his third season. Sherelle, I uh, I spent some time with uh, with a member of the team recently, and um, one of the things he said at length was that Seth Tremble is a problem. Um, I want to ask you, what are you know? Sean just laid out kind of uh, what he thinks Seth can bring. I want to ask you, what does Seth have to be? You know, is there a void of what he what he absolutely you know what his floor is, um, or is there something else that you feel like maybe he's going to bring to the table that he didn't have in his bag? Uh, last season that could potentially uh, be a real boot to this lineup? I think what you're looking for from him is continued kind of year-over-year growth. And to your point, Joey, I, people are talking about Seth and the way he's playing in some of these pickup games and um, in some of the organized team activities. Now, that is different than a game. Um, and we've seen when we get these reports, sometimes the, the guys come out and they they do as advertised and you're like, wow, those reports are correct. And then there are other times with players uh, in recent years where those reports do not come to fruition. And you're kind of like, what what was everybody seeing in the offseason? I think S- Trimble will, will be closer to the former because I think there is a need um, on the team for someone to get into transition, someone uh, to defend. Uh, I think uh, Jay Billis, I think Jay Billis and Jay Williams, every time they do a Carolina game, they talk about how fun it is to watch Seth Trimble kind of get into his stance and guard and defend. I think this year he's he's laid the expectation down that he's going to be a good defender. So this year it's about what can you add offensively that will help UNC. And I think Sean really just nailed everything. You know, there's, there's not a lot else to say in that his uh, shooting percentage was good, but it, it was a small sample size. So he'll need to continue to be able to do that once the non-conference ends and into ACC play. I think that was one of the issues is that sometimes in ACC play, he was a little gun shy. And I think, you know, going back to the Alabama game, since that is um, the elephant that's beside me right now, when we talk about Seth Trimble, I think personally that Hubert Davis took him out not because he was taking shots, but because he wasn't taking shots there in the second half. Like if you're going to be in um, the UNC offense and the way they want to play, if you have an open shot, you have to take it. And I think when he started not taking those shots is when Hero Davis, you know, went to Paxson Wojcik. So that is my opinion on how that situation went down. And I think it has served as motivation for Seth during the off season to improve uh, as an overall player. And I think you'll see that. I mean, he just he has the ability to guard multiple positions. He has the ability to finish in transition even though there are times where you're kind of like he jumps too soon or is too far, but I think he's, he's growing. And I think you just want to see continued year over year growth. And you, if you see that it'll manifest itself in his three point shooting numbers. Um, all his other stats are pretty much up his, he cut his uh, turnover rate in half last year. His offensive rating went up by like 20 points last year. So you just want to see continued improvement. Um, and there's going to be a role for him too. So I don't, I don't, I think people who anticipate him not having a role just don't understand the way Hubert Davis has played the last few years, um, especially when you have younger players who don't get the the minutia and finer details of defending in the ACC. I think uh, you know one thing to add, and we'll be curious if it's Seth or or who it is. Last year in the summer and preseason, we talked a lot about. Uh, Cormac Ryan and Harrison Ingram and even Paxson Vojic from a leadership perspective. And I think you have RJ as a, as a fifth year, uh, but you know, is he the most vocal guy? I think that that's the question. Who's going to be bringing that leadership role. I think you saw Cadeau uh, start to get a lot more comfortable as the season went in terms of being vocal on the court and in, in timeouts. But when you have a guy, you know, now a, a veteran and, and third year, you know, can he, I don't. He, he's not. I don't think he's the personality that's going to fully fulfill that. But can he play a role in that leadership aspect that we saw such an improvement from last year compared to two years ago? Yeah. If you if you the two guys we're talking about, R.J. Davis has been at UNC for five years, and who's been at UNC longer? I guess the second longest. It's Jalen Washington and Seth Trimble. Somehow this will be their third year at uh, UNC. So um, that moves us on to the next one, Sherelle. I'm, I'm glad you kind of segued there. 
I don't know that there has been a player that has as much perceived negative pressure on him as Jalen Washington. And by negative pressure, I mean kind of this this thought process because of what happened with North Carolina not landing certain bigs in the portal, this desire to replace Armando Baycott, this desire to to fill in you know the net rebounding that they had last year that Baycott provided. Uh, I think you're looking at a situation right now where there's a lot of people, whether fairly or unfairly, that feel like if Jalen Washington does not you know, produce, then dot, 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 negative consequence, negative consequence. Cheryl, I'm going to put that at your feet right now. Uh, what do you feel like Jalen Washington has to be able to do at a bare minimum for North Carolina to be uh, at least remotely close to what they think they can and want to be this coming season? Be the best version of himself and not try to be Armando Baycott or any post player that UNC has had in the past. Because UNC is going to be different this year. And I think we all need to start getting our collective heads around it now. It's not going to look the same. It's not going to be... Uh, you know, drop it off in the post, pound three dribbles and make a move. That's not his game. He knows that. UNC knows that. He said that. Opponents know that. So it's it's not going to be the same thing. It's going to look very different. And so um, if you try to replace what Armando Baycott was, then you're not playing to your personal strengths. Um, and if the coaching staff tries to replace what Armando Baycott did with Jalen Washington, they're not putting him in the best position to succeed. So when I say he needs to be the best version of himself, that is what are his strengths. Um, I think Sean, from the very first time we watched him play, like whenever that was, years, decades ago, it feels like, Sean was like, oh, he catches the ball, he faces, and his mid-range is pretty much unstoppable. That's who he is. Um, we Hubert Davis, the the well-traveled quote now about him being the best big, best shooting big man in America. Well, you know, that Syracuse game, he hit uh, at least one three, and then uh, Charleston Southern, he had a couple. He's got to do that more regularly and, and do that consistently. And then he does have to rebound um, from the offensive side. He has to rebound, um, and he just has to be a competent defender. He's not going to be Armando Bacot on the defensive end either. Um, so just, like, don't don't fall victim to comparison and the expectation of trying to replace somebody who was an All-American and a, you know, a kind of a Carolina legend, the all-time leading rebounder in four years. Don't try to be that person. Just be Jalen Washington. Do what the coaching staff asks you to, and I think uh, he'll be fine. But there hasn't been a player, to your point, Joey, in a long time where, uh, get ready for the ding, Sean, where the variance in how he plays uh, will change North Carolina's trajectory potentially. Now, they, they have been Allen Lubin, and who knows who's going to start between those two. Um, at the center, I mean, they, they could even go a different way with the center position. But uh, if Jalen Washington can be a good rebounder and he kind of fulfills some of his promise um, now two and a half years away from, um, you know, those injuries, then North Carolina can be a really, really good team. But if he's not able to kind of take the next step, then that definitely lowers the ceiling for UNC a ton. Before we go to Sean, I'm going to ask you to this and I'm going to get off. How many times do you think he's played more than 15 minutes in a game in his two seasons at UNC? I'd say you can count him on one good, hand. Good, good question right off. Um, seven. I'll say three. Three. Joey got it. Mm-hmm. Um, so there were the back-to-back games when uh, Armando and uh, Pete Nance were hurt. Yep. Um, so it was 27, ga- points against, 27 minutes against Virginia. He played the next game, I think it was 16 minutes. And then he played against Charleston Southern 16 minutes. So those three times in his two seasons. Yeah, it makes you worry about his – well, not worry. I shouldn't say – I shouldn't frame it that way. It makes you wonder about how focused on his conditioning things have been this summer because I guarantee you we're not the first people to think about that. I'm sure there's a lot of folks uh, inside the um, – inside the, you know, the Deanie Smith Center, specifically around strength and conditioning, that are, are probably paying attention to, to getting him to be able to play extended minutes, including – a faster tempo, which we're fairly certain is, is what Hubert Davis is going to want to do. All right, Sean, I gave Sherelle kind of the floor. I'm going to give you the, the ceiling or the roof. Um, you tell me how, how high the ceiling could be for Jalen Washington. Um, and if you want to, you know, if you want to go BHAG with it, that's fine. Or you can be realistic. But what is the ceiling for Jalen Washington uh, this coming season? So I think, you know, he's such an interesting case study because to Sherelle's point, he brought up 
uh, you know, the minute, the minutes per game, how many times has he played over, you know, 17 minutes? Um, you look at the defensive side and the conditioning. And to me, the biggest concern is the agility on that defensive end of, you know, how much improvement did he make on that end? But if, if, if you're just looking at another team or say you're an NBA team running your, your analytical models, he is going to pop out and like, they're going to be alarm bells ringing based on what he produced in minimal minutes last year. But from, you know, an offensive efficiency standpoint was off the charts. He was 99th percentile in, in synergy. Um, you know, he was excellent in pretty much every category offensively. He improved his three point shooting where he was a threat. Uh, and in my mind, he has, you know, if you had to say, Hey, three seconds left, I'm going to put somebody in one position like I'd probably take him over anybody in the country on on that mid range face up jump shot um, in terms of what he has, even though we didn't see it as much last year. So I think there's a lot of from a number side, a lot that showcases what he can do with with larger larger minutes. But it, it's all going to go back to um, you know I, I think the agility and conditioning standpoint. Um, you know obviously the strength is an issue, but you saw his block rate go up significantly. If you look from offensive rebounding on a per minute basis, he was pretty much the same as Armando. Uh, but I think there's still a lot of room for growth. So, you know, I think in a best case scenario, he turns into that, what we've seen over the years, that UNC big that takes that leap from, hey, they are efficient off the bench to now you're a bona fide starter playing, you know, 25 minutes a game and, and averaging in, in double figures. Um, so, I think that might be a stretch, but there's a lot of number signs that showcase what he can do and how efficient he can be offensively. But it's defensively that that's the concern, um, you know, especially in space and and how people want to potentially maybe, you know, try to body him up or, or target him as well as the decision making and processing, uh, which was an improvement from last year. But those are the biggest factors, because once again, 99th percentile offensively and very limited possessions, but also 26th percentile defensively. So there's a big, a big gap that needs to be, be solved for. Would you say there's a variance? Is that what you would say? <laughs> sure. I'll go ahead. Ding. Uh, his per 40, uh, again, limited sample last year, 18 points, 12 rebounds, 2.7 blocks. So eye popping for sure. Um, but can it, can he make that, uh, transition into playing more minutes per game every single night the rigors of the acc and, and you know just the physicality that the game uh, has and, and brings um with this non-conference schedule that unc has the travel just add all that together plus you're adding more minutes than he's played in his entire basketball career high school aau or college thus far like can he just can his body handle it and can he produce over and over and do it again and again and, I mean, you know, I don't think what? usage rate, sorry, Sean, I don't think his usage rate is going to be anything near where it Baycott's was, but if he can give you something like that per 40 in 28 minutes, I think UNC fans and the staff and anybody associated with this program will take that and run and do naked somersaults all the way down Manning Drive. Sean, go ahead. The, the, one, <laughs> uh, the, the one thing in terms of using his shooting ability, I think we saw it in, in high school a lot where he was a utilized as a trailer he come down uh you know they pitch it to him and and he's spotting up and and knocking in you know threes from that that top of the key uh spot and you know i think there there are going to be a lot of opportunities for him and cadeau in the pick and roll but also for unc to push especially with that you know the one through four that they're going to have look for early early three or or leak out or attack the rim and you know if it's not there he can be coming down and and uh once again you're going to have have another five trying to guard him on the perimeter. So just another area that can be utilized offensively for him. Absolutely. And I made a joke in, in our, you know, in our behind the scenes chat here that, you know, he should go be 2016 Bryce Johnson. I don't think he has to be that, but man, if he showed some of that improvement, um, at least with his you know lateral mobility, and like you said, Sean, improving on that, that defensive number, uh, I think North Carolina fans would, would immediately feel much better about the prospects for this season. Uh, and how deep they may be able to go. Uh, before we get into our two cents, brought to you back in Gruity, I want to give a shout out to uh, Ben Alred. Um, ben is a big time employee over at the farm in Chapel Hill. Uh, he was instrumental in helping 
with uh, with a, a charity event that I was involved in this past weekend for the organization that I run. And Ben's a huge listener to the show, so I want to make sure I give him a shout out and tell him how much we appreciate what he does in the community, but also for listening to the show. So Ben, big ups to you, sir. It was good uh, spending time with you yesterday. All right, guys, two pennies time. Uh, this is our segment where we go to our two cents brought to you by Congruity. Why is it brought to you by Congruity, Joey, you say? Well, listener, I will say this to you. Congruity is every bit the national brand that North Carolina basketball is. Uh, but they also have the local reputation that some other schools and athletic programs think that they have national, but they're, they're more just local. Congruity has both, right? Congruity is a local presence, very strong. Uh, you know, they're hatched right here in North Carolina, but they have built such a reputation in the uh, business, small business, medium-sized business space uh, of efficiency and helping with your, your back office stuff that they've got the national brand now. I want you to send an email to Matt at congruityhr.com. He's going to get in touch with you and let you know exactly personal service, what he can do, a congruity can do to help your smaller, medium-sized business. I don't think you will be uh, dissatisfied. I think you'll be absolutely thrilled that you reached out to Matt. Um, you know, big Tar Heels, they understand what small and medium-sized businesses need from your uh, HR, your benefits, your payroll, all the stuff that you don't want to spend time with because it sucks the life out of you when you're trying to run a business. Let them handle it. Congruity is going to take care of you. Check them out, congruityhr.com. Uh, go see them. Please do, and you'll be glad you did. All right, guys, Sean, give me one penny uh, that you'd like to leave the show with tonight. Last time we were talking about how exciting it was to get the guys on campus and, and what can happen from a recruiting standpoint. And I think, you know, even the guys that maybe uh, weren't as enthusiastic or maybe UNC was trailing, you've seen them come out, as you put it, Joey, and and hit all the right, right buttons in terms of a, a strong visit. So, you know, now it'll be interesting to, to see where everything ends up. And once again, I think, I think in terms of where UNC is in the, the pecking order, uh, you take a guy like Braylon Mullins, where it's going to be hard for him to get, get him out of the Midwest. But here you have Sean May, you know, as, a, as an example of, you know, hey, this is what I did. And, and look at my success, both on the court and, and off the court. Um, and, you know, wouldn't be a show if I couldn't get one Big Ten uh, dig in there. But do you know how many times Indiana has been to the Elite Eight in the last 30 years? Once, I believe. Two, yeah, yep. Carolina, One. Marcus Page, and then oh, the championship elite, game. Elite eight. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that can I be the So yeah, one, okay. one, one time. So, um, you know, I, I think ideally UNC should fare, fare well, or at least put themselves in a good situation in that one as well as the other ones. But we'll be able to know in a few weeks how everything really shook out once the dust has settled. Sorry, hit the wrong button. Thank you, guys. Um, I almost got through an entire show without stepping on myself. Um, uh, Sherelle, for your penny, I would like you to be like the uh, the alt band in 1994 live with their first album. I want you to be throwing copper at me right now. Hit me with your penny. I don't have anything great. I, I will say I thought Jared Jeffries was going to be like a Hall of Famer going back to uh, Indiana's last time in the Elite Eight. Um, and it just didn't come to fruition for a variety of reasons. I think my main penny is that officially I like nice, clean cut lines, Joey. I like things organized a certain way. And today, this podcast, we can officially, officially 100% declare the off season over. And I'm so thankful. What off season? I don't know been, about an off season. There, there, there was an off season. Have an off season. There was an off season and it was one for the books or, or maybe it wasn't one for the books that we want to erase from the history. Regardless, uh, it was a, a long winding path from the uh, aftermath of the Alabama game, sitting right here where I am now uh, with Tommy Ashley doing the, the post game uh, through all the visits and none visits and cancellations <laughs> and commitments and not commitments and, you know, the international flavor that took over uh, from June on and just everything that happened. Uh, it's finally like the team is there they're officially practicing they're going to be in front of playing in front of people in a couple of weeks and then on tv in less than a month so yeah. um 
I just want to say goodbye to the off season. I will not miss you. I hope to never think of you again. And that's my opinion. F you, you off season. I don't want you back. Remember that song? That was a good song. Um, yeah, that was. Uh, I will say, Sherelle, I'll, I'll tell you the same way I tell my daughter after uh, after she goes through some something really difficult. Usually, it's around soccer. I'm like, but did you die, right, sir? You did not die. You lived and you prospered and you got us all I, through it. So we're grateful I for would, you. I would say around April 16th. I was I, I was wondering <laughs> how long I was going to make it. You know, it was that was some times. Well, Sean and I were we're not about to let you just tap out like that. Um, and we're glad you stuck it out. Uh, and we're glad our listeners stuck it out for the show tonight. Um, again, we're continuing to do the every other week rotation, but North Carolina starts practice this week. Real practices. We're getting close, y'all. Stick with us. You've gotten through the the you know the forty days in the wilderness of the off season. Uh, we've got plenty of time you know, to talk to chop things up between now and when the ball actually tips off. But it's it's closer than it's ever been. Uh, so make sure you're ready, uh, guys. Thank you so much, Sherelle, Sean. Uh, we appreciate Johnny T-Shirt. We appreciate Congruity. We appreciate John Siegley for producing the show. But until next time on the Coast to Coast podcast, I am Joey Powell. We will talk to you very, very soon on InsideCarolina.com.